I want to take a second and just maybe reread a couple of the verses that the Corey family read to us. Uh, because I think it places just a context for us as, as we enter into this next moment um, to really think through and like understand the hope and the joy that's brought to the world. And so, I mean, like we have the shepherds, they're, they're out in the fields. You know, there's, there's some stars, there's maybe some moonlight going on, but it's a pretty quiet, maybe uneventful evening. Maybe a fox hasn't come around to try to steal the sheep or anything, but they're kind of minding their own business, maybe around the fire, no electricity, nothing going on. And then out of the blue, uh, some angels show up. Now, I don't know what you're like when, when new things kind of pop up or uncertainty happens, but these guys are full of fear. Fear of the uncertainty, fear of not knowing what's going on. And the angels, they know that. They come from the Lord. The Lord in all of His glory shows up with these angels. Maybe not all of His glory, but the glory of the Lord showed up. And it says this, as they spoke to Him, Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. Now, what I love about that verse is it's not just, I bring you good news of joy. This is like good news of great joy. Like great joy. Like A&M is still in the playoff conversation in December. Great joy, right? Like this is great joy. Not like, hey, I'm coming to church and I'm, I'm in the service and I'm kind of going through, I'm singing joy to the world. No, like this is like big things have happened. Like this is a big moment. And so when we walk into a room and we start talking about joy, like lots of different emotions probably come up inside of us. And so this morning we want to talk about how we cultivate, how we cultivate that joy inside of us this season. But it's been a hard year. And so if we could, just for a second, in the quietness of, in the moment where you are, just ask the Lord, God, will you, will you be bigger than all the things I'm going through right now? God, will you be bigger? And, and just give me a soft heart about how I can cultivate joy in a season that's been described as having great joy. So will you take a minute and just ask the Lord to do that? Well, God, we know that you are a God that transforms. Like you change, you change hearts. God, you, you took our life that was running far away from you and you offered forgiveness and hope and transformed our life, changed our path and allowed us to be in right standing with you. And so God, this year again, uh, we ask you in this season that you would transform our heart right now as we celebrate a season that's supposed to be marked with great joy. And God, that, that we wouldn't be content with just a little bit of joy. But God, we celebrate you and your coming with great expectation and great joy. And so God, soften our hearts. God, give us practical things that we can do for that. God, we love you. We trust you. I pray in your son's name. Amen. All right, sorry to keep y'all standing so long. Uh, y'all can have a seat. Hey, if you would, open up your Bibles to uh, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Um, we've already read Luke, so we won't read that again. Uh, but Philippians chapter 4. 
So this past Saturday, not yesterday, but the Saturday before, uh, my family and I, we got to go to a high school girls volleyball game. And th the reason we went is because the College Station High School Cougars were in uh, a playoff run that was pretty special. And so they had passed like the first couple rounds of the playoffs and uh, they decided um, that on Saturday that they were going to play at Rudder High School against a school in Magnolia. Uh, a friend of ours, their daughter's on the team. And so we figured we would go and just support. Uh, the, actually, volleyball is a, is a fun game to watch. And so we went. And it was this back and forth battle between a uh, high school from Magnolia and the Cougars of College Station High School. Back and forth, back and forth. Finally, the fifth set happens, and it's just a 15, just in case you didn't know that. And so the 15th point is won by College Station High School, and this is the picture of the moment that it happened. I mean, like, look at these girls. You have the libero, and I didn't know what a libero was uh, until just a few years ago, but that's the girl in the pink. She gets to rotate in and out at any time. Uh, and then all these other players, I mean, are just pumped and excited. I mean, look at the coach's face right here, Coach Street. Uh, she's awesome. She's pumped and everything. But that's not my favorite part of the picture. Uh, even though these girls did something really special, really amazing, uh, moved on to the next round, they even won the next round and lost, I believe, in the Elite Eight of all the state of Texas. But that's not my favorite part of the picture. Uh, my favorite part of the picture is actually behind everybody, behind the girls. Uh, you see, like, all up here are a bunch of fans, and so just so you could see it, I figured I'd zoom in on it a little bit uh, just to show you what's going on. But I mean, uh, I know a lot of the people in this picture. Uh, some are really good friends, some are acquaintances, some are people that I work with. Uh, but, but I love this expression right here, hands up, mouth wide open, like amazing. He's got a granddaughter on the team. Uh, this is me right here. Uh, I, have no, um, I have no player in the fight. I just got a friend whose daughter's on the team, and I'm thrilled. Uh, <laughs> You know, th like, like this is my wife right here with the unusually long arms. And, uh, and so she's, she's right there. And then these are our friends who have a daughter on the team. They're, they're thrilled. And then this is an uncle of somebody. And then there are others all around. I mean, like, like this guy right here. I mean, just like, I can't believe it. Like, we did it. Like, we won. It's amazing. Uh, but what's interesting to me in this picture is that nothing has changed in the world. I mean, like, I know a lot of people here, coworkers, acquaintances, really good friends. And I know that 2020 has been a hard year. I know that their businesses have, have d dramatically decreased in revenue. I know that, that some of their parents are significantly struggling with some health issues. I know that, that in that moment, there are hard conversations that had to happen in the week before. I know in that moment that, that there are some family dynamics that have been tough. And there is thing after thing after thing that would make us think that there's no way that anybody could celebrate in the middle of it. But yet in the middle of all of that crazy, in the middle of 2020, there is this group of people that has their arm raised, has their voices screaming, has, is so excited that masks have fallen down to their chin. All these things are going on. But do these people know that there's a global pandemic still happening? Yes. But because their view has shifted, because their eyes are looking somewhere else, there is a joy in their heart. Nothing changed in their outside world. Nothing. But for a moment, they got to see something different and they got to celebrate. Now, the reason I say that is because we're in the middle of a season that's supposed to be marked with great joy. Like we're, like we're in the middle of a season that's supposed to be celebrated. And, and if you read some psychology books or if you just Google the Christmas blues, um, you will see that historically this season is not necessarily one that's filled with great joy for our culture. Normally. 
Normally, there's a lot of anxiety. Normally, depression will go up or spike during the season. Normally, there will be expectations that are missed, and so there will be frustration that will rise up in this season. But you take what normally happens, then you add in some abnormal things, and it just seems like we're heading down a path during this Christmas season. It's supposed to be marked with great joy, but it's going to be even more difficult as we navigate celebrating the birth of Jesus. And so the question that I have to ask today, the question that we have to answer is, if this season is supposed to be marked with great joy, what are the things that we can do to cultivate that type of joy in our life? Like a type of joy or inner contentment and satisfaction that knowing that God will use all the things that are going on in our life for his glory and for our good. Like how can we cultivate that inside of us? And so Philippians chapter 4 gives us not necessarily things that Paul intends to talk about joy, but I think there are some principles in here that we can pull out and we can take so that we can have and hopefully have this season marked with joy. Look at Philippians chapter 4 starting in verse 8. And this is Paul's kind of ending letter to the church at Philippi. And he kind of starts writing a bunch of things, a bunch of principles for him. And it says this in verse 8. It says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and then look at this, and the God of peace will be with you. So, so let's look at the end of verse 8. We're going to kind of work our way backwards, and we're not going to go through all of these points, but I want you to see something. The first thing at the end of verse 8 is I want you to think about these things. It's, it's the verb that is inside of this verse. And what Paul is saying is, hey, there are all these things, that, but I want you to think about them. Like, I want you to ponder them. Like, I want you to set up a space where you can remember them. And you can concentrate on them. And you can almost, in a way, meditate on them. I want you to live your life in such a way where you have some capacity to sit here and ponder and think about what to do. And I think one of the battles that we face inside of this season is that we normally live a really busy life and we have a very full schedule. But then you add Christmas party, and then you add this thing, and then you add work party, and then you add this party, and then you add this thing, and then you add shopping and shopping and shopping, and then all this other stuff. And we never create a space for us to think and ponder. Like a space that's quiet. A space where, where we can consider all the things that Paul asked us to consider. And so the first thing that we have to do if we're going to cultivate joy inside of the Christmas season is we have to think about certain things. We have to consider them. We have to spend time with them. Sorry, this is my first time to do a slide deck, and I didn't do the, there you go, there are all the points. So, um, so, so we have to think, like, like we have to think. But what is the object of our thinking? Like, like, we can't just say, hey, we're going to sit here and ponder and think, but there has to be an object of something. So let's keep working our way backwards. So it says, think about these things. And then the next thing right before that says, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. He says, I want you to take the things that are worthy of praise in your life, all the good things, And I want you to ponder them. I want you to consider them. I want you to spend time putting them into context of your life. 
Now, it, it, that's an interesting thing because most of us would run in this moment right to the things that are worthy of our praise would, would be the Lord. And, and yes, you would, that would be true. Like God's graciousness to us, God's forgiveness of us, and the foundation of our joy has to be an active pursuit of the Lord. I would agree with all of that. But there are things that God places in our life that are good things, things that are worthy of praise in our life, in our heart, that God wants us to consider. Like there's a reason why in John 10 says, John 10, 10 says that I've come that you may have life, and not just life, but have it abundantly. You see, there are moments where God brings blessings and good things into our life for his glory and for our good. And so if we want our season marked by joy, then we have to consider some of those things, right? But so often we let the outside circumstances or the battles that we have going on rule the day. And so I want to give you one thing that we do as a family that helps. And it's not new to me. Uh, I heard about someone doing this, and so don't think that I'm the smartest person in the room because I'm not. But this is one thing we do when we sit down at the dinner table. We used to do highs and lows, right? Hey, tell me something high about your day and tell me something low about our day. But, but what I realized is that we often spent the most time on our what? Lows, right? Like my son's really good. Hey, what was annoying to me today was dot, dot, dot. And so instead of doing highs and lows, we just do what we call good things. Good things. And we don't sit down at the dinner table every night. We have four kids, and so we're running around. But when we do, we sit down, and we're like, all right, let's talk about something good that happened today. And so Brooke will go, my oldest, and she'll be like, well, I like basketball practice today. And then Hudson will go, well, I, I didn't like English. I'm like, well, Hudson, we're not talking about what we didn't like. We're talking about what we do like. <laughs> right? And we go all the way around the table and we just say, hey, these are the good things that, has ha that have happened to me today. And then after every one of those good things, we ask some sort of follow-up question. Hey, so, so like what was it about basketball that was so good? Or, hey, I love going on a bike ride with my friends. Or I love the weather. Or I blank. And we always ask a follow-up question to it so that we can ponder it even more and think about it. Now, but before you get any image of that being a perfect time in our family, it's not always perfect. Like, there are moments that I come home from work, and I think, what's my good thing today? Nothing. I got nothing good. And sometimes the only good thing that I can think about is, well, at least it's cold, and, my, and I like my vest game. It's pretty good. I've got some good vests, and so I got to wear a vest today. That's it. Sometimes that's what it's like. But inevitably, what happens in that moment is the stress of the day, all the things that have gone wrong, all the things that have tried to pull my attention and have dominated my thought process, now change from problems to good things. And it lifts my spirit. And it allows us to laugh. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten to the dinner table and I'm like, there's no way I'm laughing today. There's no way I'm doing any of that today. Only to find myself spirit, spiritually raised up and encouraged because we talked about all the good things that are going on. And the simple things. So that's the first thing. If we're going to think about things that are worthy of praise, we've got to speak them out loud. The second thing Second tool to kind of help us think about things that are good is what I call affirmations. Affirmations. And it's this, that when we see something good, we tell the other person. And so there's a new thing that I've come to live by that if I think it and it's positive, I try to say it. If I think it and it's positive, I try to say it. Now, that little qualifying thing is really important because there are plenty of things I think that I should never say, right? But if we think it and it's positive, we should say it. That's why Proverbs 25, 
11 says this, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Now, that may not mean a lot to us right now. I mean, I don't think there's any woman in the room that has an apple of gold and a setting of silver on their ring finger. But it, but it signifies worth. It signifies value. And so sometimes in our life, we need other people. If we're going to cultivate joy, we need other people that are going to call out and tell us things, affirm things inside of us, or affirm ways that God has blessed us, or affirm ways that God is moving in our life. And, and that even happened to me this week. Like this week, other people lifted my spirit. One of the things that I get to do in the community is, is serve on the board at Brazos Christian School. And if you've been um, involved at, in a school at any level, you know that this year has been a difficult year, to say the least. And, and Monday night, to be honest, kind of culminated in this very um, tough night for me. And I was pretty beat down. I was struggling quite a bit because there's no right decisions to make. Normally, I try to be a consensus builder, but literally, there was no consensus to be made. And so I'm sitting here thinking about it, getting pretty upset, getting frustrated, and getting really, really kind of annoyed at everything. And then Tuesday morning, I don't know if a friend texted out and said, hey, you need to encourage George right now. But that day, I got text after text after text, after text, after text, after text. Just saying how much they appreciated the work and the time. And it took me from this place where I was frustrated. And it took me to, okay, we're going to make it through. And that's worthy of praise. And so here's the thing a challenge that I would give you. Number one, will you think about the good things every day? Maybe for the next 19 days between now and Christmas, will you write down all the good things that are going on in your life? And it could be as simple as, hey, I had a really great meal today. It wasn't ramen, right? Or it could be I had a great conversation that spurred me on. Or it could be, hey, the weather was nice. But we just list out those good things. And the second thing is if you think something that's positive about someone else, that's worthy of praise in their life, like will you tell them? Will you tell them? The way I like to think about that is if I think something twice that's positive, I'm going to say it. And that will cultivate joy inside of our life. You see, like, the, the affirmation isn't just for the receiver, it's actually also for the giver. Has anyone ever sat down and written a note to somebody that you're like, hey, I need to just share this with them? Has anyone ever done that? I hope, I hope a lot of hands would raise at this point. Or send a text. Oftentimes, your perspective changes when you give that affirmation too. So what are the things worthy of praise that God is doing in our life? And then what are the things that are worthy of praise that God is doing in someone else's life? Let's ponder these things. And let's make that an ethic in our life for the next 19 days. Now, second thing. Oh, you already have the answers. Second thing. If you go back one more. It says, think about these things. If there's anything worthy of praise, if there's any excellence, whatever is commendable, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is just, whatever is honorable, and the first thing he starts with is whatever is true. Whatever is true. So if we're going to cultivate joy this season, we've got to think about the things that are true in our life. And we live in a news cycle that constantly barrages us with all sorts of news. And it's hard to wade out what is true, isn't it? And, and, and I'm not making any statements about what's going on right now in our culture, but if you wanted to find an article that supported your opinion, you could find it. 
If you thought masks were the craziest thing and had no help at all, I could point you to charts and articles that make that point. If you thought masks were the saving grace of all of humanity, and if I just wore a mask every time, I would never get COVID, I can point you to articles that would support that point. And so right now, in our culture, we have an information overload. And I think we've become paralyzed trying to wade through all of the information that is constantly bombarding us, right? And not only that, not only is it trying to bombard us and all these things, but we even sensationalize the news. I mean, it happened to me yesterday as I was going over our notes for this time together. I'm going over the notes, making some few adjustments, and then a pop-up comes from my news app on my computer, and it says, Prince William breaks up with Kate Middleton over the phone. I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, I don't follow the royal family. Uh, you know, when Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, you know, um, got married. I mean, my wife was up at 4 a.m. watching the thing. I continued to sleep because it didn't really affect me too much. But I was genuinely curious. So I clicked on the news article. And here I am, you know, trying to plan for a sermon, getting mad at Prince William. <laughs> well, it wasn't right now. You know, Prince William and Kate Middleton have been married uh, since 2011. I had to look it up. I didn't know that. I had to look it up. Uh, and they've been dating since 2003. Once again, I had to look it up. And at some point between 2003 and 2011, Prince William broke up with Kate Middleton over the phone. But we sensationalize the news to the point where it made it sound like it was yesterday it happened, right? And so not only do we have all of these different opinions and scientific studies that point us all in the different directions of what we should do and how things are going, but it gets sensationalized to the point where it's hard to know what's even true. And so we have to find something in our life that is true that we can focus on. And so what I know to be true is God's word. And so there are a few things that I want to tell you. All the answers right there. <laughs> the first thing is this. Uh, we're forgiven. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That you and I, because of a baby that came in a manger, we're forgiven and we can be in right relationship with God. The second thing, God is faithful to us. Hebrews 10, 23, listen to this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Not only did God just for, forgive us and give us right relationship with him, but he's also faithful to us. That's why it can say in James 1, 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when we encounter trials of many kinds. Like, it's crazy verse. It's a crazy idea to count it joy when we're in the middle of trials. But the reason we can do that is because God's faithful to us. And we can spend time, we need to ponder God's faithfulness to us. The moments when my parents' business was dying and God moved, changed my plans to the point where now I met my wife when I was, had changed plans to the time when I'm driving up, you know, in Colorado, driving back home because we were living in Denver, driving up the mountains after skiing, it's snowing, and my car just starts peeling out and going back and forth down Highway 70 as we're going up with no guardrails on the side and a steep decline. We need to count the times that God's been faithful in our journey so that when the trials come, we can count it joy because he's up to something bigger than we even know. We've got to consider that. The third thing, that God has a purpose for us. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. We need to ponder that God has placed us where we are 
with who we're around in the job and the class that we're in with the kids that we have for a purpose. And that's a true statement that we've got to ponder and consider. The, the next one, Romans 12, 6, 8, that we are gifted. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads, leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We've got to understand that God has gifted us and has designed those gifts to be worked out. And that's a true thing that we must ponder and consider. How we do that. The last one, that we are valuable. We are valuable. Luke 12, 7, why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you have more value than many sparrows. That there is a difference in value that God sees of us and the rest of his creation. That if God takes care of the birds and the sparrows, how much more is he going to take care of us? That's a true statement, that we are valuable to God. He sees value in us. And so we have to consider that and ponder that. And think it through. Now, there are more things in Philippians chapter 4 for us to consider and think through. I mean, we have whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence. We don't have time to necessarily go through them today but what I'm convinced of is if we just took a small step and started thinking, okay, these are the good things that God has done in us. And then we took another small step and said, hey, these are the things that I can affirm in other people and help bring them joy. And then we took another small step and said, hey, I'm going to ponder the things that are true. I just wonder what our season would look like. I just wonder what the next 19 days would look like. If we just committed ourselves to those three things. But, but here's, what, here's what I know. Like it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle. Uh, Mike Tyson, 54 years old, just got back in the ring again. Uh, he fought Roy Jones Jr. I'm never going to battle Mike Tyson unless it's an old Nintendo game like Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. I'm just never going to do it. But at 54 years old, his quickness is still there. I watched a video of him training. It was fascinating. It was amazing. But he and Roy Jones Jr. got into the ring. They had their hands up, and they started fighting. I watched the highlights of the fight because I didn't want to pay the pay-per-view to, uh, to watch it. And after eight rounds, after eight rounds, Roy Jones Jr., and Mike Tyson standing right next to the referee. They said it was a draw. They said it was a draw, which is crazy. Anybody, knows, anybody that knows Mike Tyson knows he doesn't get a draw. Like he wins. But what was interesting is all the commentators were talking about the battle that was there. The fight that was there. The training that had to take place before to get Mike Tyson in shape. And for him to be able to hit and to go and to make the right moves and... All the whatever you call those. But it was an eight round knockdown, drag out fight. The reason I say that is because we're gonna leave this place and we're gonna enter in a culture that once again wants to hear negative. Once again, wants to elevate the negative things in our life. That's going to sensationalize the news. That's going to make things hard to navigate truth. We're going to live in a place where it's easier for us to think negative than positive. We're going to live in a place where we're going to just navigate the busyness of our schedule, never have time to think or ponder. And so when we leave this place, we're going to enter into a space that is going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. 
And it's going to be a battle, and you're going to take some blows. But what I can tell you is if you'll take the blows, take a break, and then step back into cultivating joy in your life, the season will be dramatically different. But it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a war. And we have to intentionally sit down and cultivate that joy in our life. My prayer and my hope for us is that in the moment of 2020, in one of the hardest years, where if we could just go back and talk about the killer hornets from the beginning of the year, that would be fantastic. But in the middle of 2020, in arguably one of the hardest years of our life, my challenge to us is that we would put ourselves in the perspective of the shepherds. And God would say, this is a season of great joy. And we would cultivate it. And we would allow joy to mark the next 19 days for us by doing those three things. All right, pray with me. God, I'm thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for the seasons that we get to navigate. God, um, your word even says that You have a plan with all the stuff that's going on over the last nine months. And so God, it's been hard to count it all joy in the middle of all that. God, it's been hard to see and experience all the things that have happened in 2020. But God, would your grace flow over us? God, would your joy that comes from actively pursuing you and setting our mind and our heart's affection on you. God, would that well up inside of us a joy that can only be described as you moving, that can only be described as as you doing something in our life. And so God, as we embark on the next 19 days, as we start the journey to Christmas, as we build anticipation of of the celebrating of the birth of your son. God, I pray you would remind us of the good things. I pray that you would give us space to think. I pray that you would prompt in us affirmations for other people. God, but most of all, I pray that we would consider what is true. That you were sitting at the right hand of the throne of God didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. And so you came through obedience to the earth. And you offered us restoration and hope and joy. So God, move in us. We trust you.